said, well, we don't think it, it has to be a, a monopoly. There can be competition in the electricity business. <clears throat> they, uh, they wrote this book, and maybe a couple dozen uh, relatives bought it. Uh, but uh, somebody in the government picked up on it, and they passed the Public Utility Regulatory Policy Act, PERPA, in 1978, which for the first time anywhere in the world allowed competition in the electricity market. Well, things started out rather slow. Uh, it, this, this, uh, this law allowed for uh, energy efficient cogeneration plants to be generated. Things started out rather slow in the 80s, uh, slow growth. But then around the world, people started picking up on this idea. And in the 90s, you saw the uh, privatization of a lot of government-owned assets. You saw a lot of countries around the world who needed new generation but didn't have the money to do it. Uh, that's what happened here in the Philippines. New generation was needed, so they went to the private sector to build the new plants, to privatize the old. And the 90s was a time of explosion in the independent power business. It was going on all over the world. Every utility in North America and Europe formed their IPP uh, division, and they were there was business everywhere. It was unbelievable. Privatization of generation, privatization of uh, distribution. It was a crazy time. Then about uh, 2002, I don't know if you remember Enron. Uh, there were a lot of things that happened, but uh, the whole international IPP business kind of collapsed. All the European and North American uh, Utilities went home and they haven't come back since then. So, and things turned into more of a regional IPP business. In India, Indian companies did the power business. In China, Chinese companies did it. Here in the Philippines, Philippine companies have been doing the independent power business. Uh, up until now, uh, now, uh, over the last 10 years, well, we're going to talk a lot today about, about uh, renewables, solar in particular. Uh, but let me just throw out an idea here that over the last 10 years, the renewables have been growing kind of like independent power business did in the 80s. It's slow. It's been growing. Now we're at the point, over the next 10 years, I think the renewable energy business is going to explode much like the independent power business exploded in the 90s. Uh, there's going to be a dramatic change in the way that electricity is produced in the next 10 years. That's all I'm going to say at this point. I'll say a little bit more in our next session when we get into the renewables. Anyway, I guess uh, our first panel here is going to be led uh, by Mike Thomas, one of the founding uh, partners of Lantau Group. I'm sorry, Mike, I don't have your whole uh, bio here, so that's all I can say about you. Mike Thomas, I've known for many years, and uh, they're doing business uh, here in the Philippines and all over, all over Asia. So, Mike, it's yours. Hello, everybody. Um, we'll just um, go straight into the panel. Um, my name is Mike Thomas. Most people know my colleague, Sarah Fairhurst. That's really probably how most of you know the Lantau Group. Anyway, I am uh, one of the other partners of that, uh, of that group. Um, I'd like to get the panelists up here. Uh, we're going to talk, or they're going to talk, and maybe I will ask a few questions, but hopefully you guys 
We'll ask lots of questions um, about electricity retail competition uh, and what are the next steps uh, for delivering a fair and viable system to which I would add, is there a step that leads to a fair and viable system? Is this something that can be done? Uh, so let's welcome up Dion James, Gavin Barfield, uh, Juan Antonio, um, and an empty chair. We, we had a small change, and then I'll uh, sit up there, and we'll all uh, I'll talk. Gavin's with uh, uh, with uh, Morocco. Uh, Dion James is with Aquapon Electricity. Uh, Juan Antonio is the Executive Vice President, Strategy and Regulation of Abilities Power, and you probably all know them better than I do, uh, but uh, let's see what we all have to say. And do please think of some really tough, interesting questions. Retail competition is not easy, it's not always fun. There are winners, there are losers, there are obstacles, there are unexpected things that happen, there are challenges that have to be gotten right. Are we ready? With that, uh, we'll... Uh, We'll get, uh, we'll get started. Um, and since we didn't really organize too much, I'm going to see who wants to say something first or whether we'll just start going into some some questions. Okay, we've taken a vote. We're going to go straight into questions. Um, and those of you who do a lot of conferences know that sometimes when you have a panel of people up in the front, um, we each speak a little bit and the time for questions gets, gets, uh, gets reduced. So the burden is now on all of you to think on your feet to come up with those questions and let's make use of the time. Um, and to sort of get the juices flowing, I'm going to ask a question but I, I don't see it as my job here in this white chair to ask all of the questions. Uh, and my first question is, uh, for anyone who wants to take it, and hopefully maybe each will say something, what do we see as the prize at the end of the journey towards retail competition? And what do we see as the biggest obstacle to get to that prize? Right, maybe I'll start as I'm close to you. Good morning, everybody. I guess the prize in terms of retail competition, it, to me, is around um, the ability that competition gives to drive innovation and to drive new products and services, and ultimately that drives down price. So I, I think the end prize is to have a market, a, a vibrant market with healthy competition, um, which allows us, which allows companies to compete with each other and come up with new, innovative. Uh, you know, better products and customers, uh, better products and services to, 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 to provide to the market and ultimately to customers. I think that's the real benefit of competition in general. Um, I guess the barriers to getting there are, are, are a number of them. And in fact, I wrote them down in the, uh, in the car on the way here. So I'll read from my phone. I, I think for Philippines, key at the moment is adequate supply. I mean, that unless you have an element, an adequate supply, then competition is very difficult to uh, to, to establish because everybody is scrapping around over the small amount of supply that, that exists in the market. Also, I think, you know, in terms of the way the market is structured at the moment, um, the, the customers need to understand and the government needs to be brave in terms of pushing forward on making customers pay the true price of power. And competition only really works and markets only really work if customers pay the true price of power and are not subsidized. And what happens at the moment in the market is Anybody who uh, is a peaky customer or anybody which is um, a costly customer to serve remains under the captive group uh, because there's no obligation for them to move and pay the, pay the true cost of power. And what that ultimately results in is the captive group in effect subsidizing some of these customers with bad load factors, peaky, etc. Uh, and that distorts the market. So it's a realization and a sort of boldness of the government to be able to stand up and say, hey, you're, 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 paying, um, you're paying less than you should, uh, big customer. You have, to, uh, you have to pay your true price of power, and that's really how a market works. And that's what's being caused, I guess, by the, by the optional element of the competition at the moment. I think another point in terms of what's holding up retail competition and why, how we need to push forward is to get a consistent and proper retail market design. The way the market is designed, the way the Western is designed, and the Western rules of retail very much follow 
the wholesale market. And that's okay if you've got a couple of hundred customers in terms of the retail, but that's not okay if you've got thousands and thousands of customers. So we need to be able to move to a proper retail market design where you have things like daily settlements, where you have a proper business-to-business -business system between um, companies to pass meter data to do customer transfers. And the market has to be set up correctly to facilitate that. So there's a whole load of regulatory issues that I think need to be addressed. The supply issue needs to be addressed. Uh, and a whole load of systems and processes that need to be put in place in order to facilitate retail competition in the Philippines. Cholo, can I? Um, Gavin, two observations. One is that you must have uh, driven a long way to get here, because that's quite a long list. And we hope you weren't driving while you were busy writing at the same time. Good morning, everyone. Um, the ultimate prize is lower prices. Uh, we have heard over the, the proceedings of the conference that we wanted the most expensive, the Philippines, in the world sometimes, and in Asia, definitely. So we have to get lower prices. The problem I'm seeing, though, at the moment is a steady uh, implementation of a market is an issue. Um, somehow the goals are put forward and it's irrational goals. We can't get there in those time frames. So we have to have a steady, rational implementation and observe behaviors and just implement slowly, looking at what, where the issues are. But it has to happen fast. The market has to have some way of working without interference. My worry is that there are quite a few layers of costs coming in and those costs are adding to the cost of electricity. It's working in Europe because I think they've limited the amount of intervention in markets and the also prices come down. But that's a reasonably mature market already. We're a developing country, so we have to try and balance that carefully. And my worry is the costs coming in. Um, good morning. Um, I realize that you know everybody is looking eventually for uh, lower prices or whatever, but to me the I mean, you know, that's one of the value propositions that people are looking for when they uh, when they choose a uh, an alternative supplier. Uh, it may not be the only concern, but, but to me, the real price is uh, just the ability to make that choice. You know, I've been dealing with uh, regulators for a long time, and uh, the common complaint is that you know we we don't have a choice. The uh, uh, the distributor is making all the decisions for us. You know, and to me, the opportunity to make those decisions for themselves, for the uh, for the customers, is the ultimate price, whether they act on it or not. Right? Um, uh, real well, instead of obstacles, maybe um, let me give some ideas of what I think are needed uh, for this to move forward. Uh, First, I, I think uh, Gavin touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, so you need to make sure that the uh, that in the process uh, the captive market is protected. That they they don't end up subsidizing one way or another uh, the contestable customers. Um, the other thing is uh, you need to um, somehow move forward and at the same time, you know, given a situation right now where there's limited supply, um, you know, it, it may be difficult to do away immediately with the optionality. I mean, to make it mandatory because in a sense that optionality is giving the protection to the contestable customer, um, you know, because, well, he can't be worse off than where he is now. Okay. And the third thing I, that you know is important to me is that we shouldn't try and level the playing field by putting in uh, more regulation or more legislation that effectively just adds barriers or constraints. Right? You you know you, you don't level the playing field by going to the least common denominator and you know, saying, well, this guy's more expensive. We raise everybody to that level. And now they can compete. Because, you know, that takes away from the potential for the customer. So that sets the scene. Does anybody want to jump in and ask a question at this point? We can't really see you. So even if you ask a question, we won't be able to tell who you are. Okay, let me ask another question, though. 
Um, I'm, going to, I'm just going to ask the question, is the regulatory framework ready for retail competition? Boss? <laughs> maybe I should have passed on asking the question. Or maybe I asked the question a different way. Different way. Do you see any changes needed to the way regulation is administered to make it compatible with retail competition? Because we've seen changes needed in every other market, so it's not a, that's not a, a, a local criticism, that's just an observation that it is a very different uh, set of arrangements. So we've talked about obstacles like you know, whether people really think the prices will go down or whether the price is choice or whether there are systems or implementations or cross subsidies that will be getting up. But a lot of these things at the end of the day tie back down to sort of the, the state of affairs with economic regulation. Any comments there? On that one. Um, one of the issues uh, facing the retail electricity suppliers right now is uh, the differences in tax treatment. Um, with respect to, I guess, customers that are, um, uh, you know, for, for one reason or another, uh, they have, uh, you know, maybe they're uh, tax zero, I mean, zero rated as far as such value. So the, um, the fact that we have a single billing system um, gives an advantage to the, uh, um, the local rest because they're the same entity. And uh, there's never any question as to the tax treatment uh, differential between, you know, other slums, right? Between uh, the distributor when they were captive and uh, the local rest uh, when they become contestable. But it's a different uh, story for uh, a third party uh, rest. But I think that's something that. Uh, you know, that can be, I mean, like many other issues we have in the industry uh, regarding tax and tax treatment, you know, um, that's something that probably needs to be clarified outside of this. Okay, just in terms of the regulator, um, sometimes the thinking of the regulator surprises. Um, you see it sometimes in public forums, you see it in the newspapers. And I just think there's one step that we tend to miss sometimes is a very good small group dialogue with the regulator. We somehow missing that. The public hearings we have, we find, get distracted by some political influence, some people who want to be heard. Um, and it's not a very fruitful discussion at the, at the end of the day. So we need to have some kind of, they've started study groups which help. Um, but there needs to be a bit more, especially on what is happening with market developments. I think if you look at the design of the, the market, of the Wesson at the moment, uh, it's, as I said before, it's designed as a, for a wholesale market. So when you do a wholesale market, you have a very limited number of people who you're interacting with. You've got a handful of generators, a handful of distribution utilities, uh, and, and you, you, you interact in the market in a certain way. Uh, and those rules have, in effect, just been extended a bit to account for the fact that you now have retail market, which is just about doable when you have a handful, 300, 500 odd customers. So we still have very similar rules in the Wesson uh, for retail customers as we do as a wholesale rule. So, for example, uh, you have to declare your, your BCQ values at an individual customer level to, the, to each generator. Now, that makes sense at a wholesale level. And that's just about doable, a bit of a headache, doable at a handful of customers. But just imagine if you have a full retail contestability and you have to nominate five, you know, for Morale, you have to nominate 5.2 million customers against each of the generators for every single period of every single day. That's just not practical in a retail situation. Um, we have a monthly settlement process. That's not really practical in a, in a retail market. If you look at Singapore, and I was heavily involved in the design of the NEMS in Singapore, uh, and other markets work in a similar way, that you have to have a daily type of settlement, fast, faster transaction, you have to have particular settlement periods. You also have to have the proper systems which are in place. And when you're doing 500 customers, you can manage it in Excel, you can manage it via email. But when you end up going to thousands and thousands of customers, you have to have a proper business-to-business -business IT solution in place to allow you to to go through all the market rules for transfer, who can transfer, who can't, what to do when an account closes, you know, what to do when a customer's in default, what to do when they want to change this detail, 
how you pass meter values across from one to another, how you validate, how you estimate. There's a whole list of stuff that you need to do in a retail market. And in order to move forward, in, once customer volumes increase to a number uh, that the current system becomes impractical, there's a lot of work to do in defining a, a proper retail market structure and a proper set of IT solutions that are put in place to facilitate that. We have a question. Yeah, use the microphone, it's really quite a lot of background noise. Uh, hi, uh, Vincent Dwight from Norton Rose, Fulbright. Um, some of the discussion you're having is about market reform at a retail level, moving towards the more open markets like Singapore and the UK and Australia as models. There's a different model emerging now out of New York and Hawaii predominantly, um, which is all about um, access of re retail mums and dads to be micro-generators themselves and to have equal access to the market in the same way as traditionally big generators do. Uh, and I thought the discussion that we're going to have on solar and rooftop and those sorts of issues, which is an enormous, enormous opportunity in the Philippines, um, is there an opportunity in effect, in effect to almost leapfrog the market structures that we have at the moment in some of the developed countries right across to the models being developed out of New York and Hawaii to allow all of this micro-generation to come into the market at the same time? One. One, one, one comment on, on, on that is if they come in, or there's no, no, no reason on a piece of white paper, a blank sheet of paper, um, that, that something like that is not possible. This is not a sort of a monopoly issue. This is not a, a market failure issue. The question really is, um, are the economics clean? Um, is it happening because of a tariff structural design issue? Are people wanting to come in in localized areas because eventually they can avoid uh, transmission and distribution costs that aren't in fact avoidable by society at large? Are there other aspects of this or are they pure economic uh, opportunities because they're avoiding a capital expenditure or they're meeting a particular need or they're appealing to a particular preference or taste? Um, I think you just have to work your way through that set of questions and eliminate the most egregious uh, potential distortions, the ones that want to enter because in fact it will shift a lot of cost to other people, you really don't want that. But the ones who want to enter because it will save, so the, the challenge is how, you, how, do you sort, how do you sort that out? That's proven to be quite a remarkable challenge around the world. So I wouldn't say this is an easy one. Just leave that up. I mean, I agree. I think it's a very valid point. And and if you if you think about how around the world the roles of generators and distribution utilities and retailers are going to change, it's quite evident, in my view at least, that the industry we'll be looking at in ten years' time will be diff very different to the industry now. Uh, centralised generation will will move in parts to distributed generation. Um, and that gives a very different role to traditional generators and a very different role to distribution utilities. Uh, and what it really needs is, is the regulators to be very progressive in their thinking around how they structure the market to make sure that these entities which are still going to be valuable and useful in the market are compensated and their regulatory structure works in the right way. So, you know, distribution utilities work off of a, off of a kilowatt hour base uh, a compensation method, whereas most of the costs are uh, fixed in terms of providing the physical connections, etc. Generators work off of the basic premise that they want to be generating most of the time in order to earn money. The whole distributed generation switches that whole model onto its head, and you're going to have generators who just need to fill in during intermittent periods, who just need to fill in uh, you know, when solar is out. How do you create the regulatory environment to allow those guys to economically exist in the market? Because if you just keep squeezing them and squeezing them, they'll end up just disappearing. 
Uh, and if you need them in the market, then you have to find ways. And I know Europe is, is battling with the idea of capacity payments. And how do you compensate those generators for that? And the same with distribution utilities. If, if the distribution utility becomes a sort of backup power or a secondary line which goes into your house and you're primarily just generating yourself, how do you come up with the right regulatory model to make sure it's still economically viable for a distribution utility to operate those wires and cables, uh, which you know I, I think certainly in the in the short, in the medium term would be required to, to provide network stability and to provide an, an alternative source than the distributed generation. So it really requires very very progressive regulators thinking about these challenges and making bold moves in terms of changing the regulation to uh, to accommodate these things coming in. Yeah, I guess at the end of the day, you know, however the uh, um, the industry evolves, right? You have to make sure that um, each of the services that will continue to be needed get properly compensated; otherwise, they won't exist. You know, um, and I think with respect to distributed generation, I think the uh, um, it's it's coming up now because of the technology, the availability, uh, and and at a reasonable cost of uh, uh, solar you know, and, uh, and similar systems uh, for household use. But I think the, the concept of distributed generation was discussed many years ago uh, with other technologies, right? When, uh, when small gas uh, uh, turbines became uh, more efficient and they were viewed as an alternative to you know, just large networks. Uh, you know, for maybe to run a building or something like that. Um, but each technology brings with it a different uh, set of uh, challenges, right? I mean, intermittent uh, systems require more backup, and uh, therefore you have to pay for that backup. And, uh, you know, how that is shared equitably is the challenge for them. And the challenges have been mentioned, so I just want to confirm that the process is in place for any residential consumer to put some kind of distributed generation and there's a net metering option, um, specifically for renewables, of course. So I think that more and more that has to be encouraged. Um, the utilities have to support that. Uh, we take too long to sometimes study the impact and we talk about distribution impact studies, but we can do that quickly. And as more applications come through, it could be a quicker process. Good morning. Uh, Arnel Lapore from Seneco, a uh, cooperative in Negros Occidental. My, I've been hearing the comments on this uh, retail competition, which uh, to us uh, was already implemented uh, years back. And uh, the utility are still being required to comply with certain processes. In fact, uh, we, were, we were required earlier to qualify as a local res. And it seems that uh, uh, there is no contestable market that has uh, defected from, from our distribution utilities, or the distribution uh, facilities. Still, we have this uh, uh, usual way of distributing power. It's still a captive market. Um, how I wish that there is a representative here from ARC to make a reaction or a DOE representative to make a reaction this uh, uh, thinking no? uh, these experts of our uh, panel no? to, 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 to also for us to hear how the ARC right now uh, sees this uh, retail competition uh, because it's already in place as part of the regulatory process. Thank you. If there is any I think the transition to any change or any introduction of competition in any dimension is complicated and in order to sort of get clarity all of the different stakeholders need to be communicating we're not going to get everybody on the stage today at a, at a conference but clearly um, with the stakes very high uh, dialogue is important that's been proven again and again. 
Mike, um, just as a response, a um, very valid question. We all have those issues at the moment, so we try and make it work and influence as much as possible the practical issues we face. Uh, it's a long-term industry we contract into. A new generation want some 20 to 25 year contracts. And then carving out contestability. We, we're fortunate as well, we managed to keep the contestable customers within our fold, not because we're trying to not let them go, but because practically right now, um, the way it's developed, it makes sense to try and encourage them to stay. Um, but we know with time, because the regulator has made pronouncements that the DU cannot do that in the long term, as it is, or even as a local res, it will eventually disappear, and they want the market to really come in as a res, independent of traditional utilities. So that's the thinking. Um, whether it's going to work, um, there needs to be some kind of, as has been mentioned, some kind of, you have to sustain both the supply side and the wires, and all the way through. So. It has to be done very carefully. The regulator needs more interaction, and with all of the utilities, we need to talk through. Um, I want to change gears and ask a slightly different question. Um, one of the comments, uh, maybe two, talked about uh, uh, needing to get the supply demand balance right and ensure that you don't uh, have a shortage at the time you introduce retail competition. But let me ask this, um, if you did have retail competition, 100% retail competition, would people, people be able to get their baseload power stations financed? Would, would, would power producers, uh, investors, be able to get their power stations financed on the back of an oh, uncertain retail load there's only so much Morocco to go around. How, how does one do it? Okay, we do you, so uh, we should ask generator that question, but from the discussions I've heard and from the observations, banks don't want to fund merchant plants. So they want a the long-term PSA in place and then they will finance. So this is an issue. So the banks will have to change the model as well because it makes sense, merchant plants make money but it's not a firm contract, so that's what banks want to see. I think it's a good point, and, and you know, also to look at the context of retail competition coming in in terms of how you then dovetail that with the financing of new plants, because in, in markets like this, um, PP, uh, long-term PPAs with creditworthy organizations is what banks like in order to finance, and our immediate need as of today, is more generation. Um, we're already hopefully getting towards the end, cross our fingers, of the, of the summer period uh, where we've had uh, very, very tight um, margins in terms of our reserve um, and, and interruptible low programs, as you would have known, that the, that the DOE and the Senate and Congress, etc., has been, has been pushing through. So, you know, what's critical for us in the short term is to get... Uh, you know, get more plants and get more generation on board, and that requires two things. That requires financing. Financing, the easiest way to finance that currently is through long-term PPAs, and it requires regulatory approval. And a lot of these plants that have been, um, that, are, that, are, that have, uh, have been in the regulatory approval process for quite some time. So the more we can, uh, the more the, the regulator can work with the industry and work with the generators to help new generation come online as quickly as possible. Uh, I think is, is what's needed in the short term. Any, any questions along the lines of... Let me ask... Oh, here's here comes one. Uh, good morning. Uh, just to be transparent, uh, Mr. Gavin is my boss. I'm from Meralco too. <laughs> Uh, anyone from the panel can answer this. I, I've been hearing uh, quite a bit about uh, more investment in the generation aspect. Now, also yesterday from the presentations uh, from the Department of Energy, we can just see that supply is barely ca catching up to demand. It's very slim margin of reserve. So for re a full regulation, uh, deregulated environment to work, how much spread do we need to see of total generation power, or total generated power, for us to really feel the effect of competition 
in place. And we have a theoretical value in mind. For example, we're now consuming at around 8,500 megawatts total Luzon grid uh, consumption. So are we, are we uh, waiting for some critical mass in generated volume for us to really feel that uh, maybe we can now uh, see the next layer of customers from the 500 to 750 megawatts joining the uh, contestable market. So for, for everybody, and, and we're waiting for it to spread down up to the residential accounts, but uh, we're not seeing that happening quite soon. So what, what is needed to be in place for it to work, for, for it to be felt down, down the, to the smallest accounts? Thank you. Yeah, historically, theoretical margins of supply and demand is 15 to 20 percent. Um, but that model is now out of the water because really with DG coming in, there's an expectation that the market is going to provide the generation solution. So traditional utilities are not going to go out and, and, and build, or governments are not going to build that margin in anymore. So I can see that margin staying small. And there will be pressure on, I guess, consumers or customers to be able to look at solutions as well um, from you. So utilities won't go out and build capacity anymore. I can see that not happening. I think what's important is to have good elements of liquidity in the market and, and, and good elements of excess supply that can be, that can be purchased by retailers and that, that encourages more retailers to come in. But I guess it's also worth noting that the whole idea of how a market works is that the market gives signals when new generation needs to come in through increased prices. And, and that's just how every market in the world works and electricity is no different. So the, the way the market is set up is that as the generation gets tighter and tighter and there's less capacity, prices increase. And that is then the signal for new generation to come in and to capitalize on the market. That high prices is also the opportunity for more efficient generation to come in to knock the less efficient ones off of the merit order. And that's really how the market is designed and that's how markets work. They get distorted when um, regulation and when rules and stuff come in and to try to change the market. So when you, you, you start imposing uh, caps and then you start imposing mandatory uh, mandatory you know, offers and all of these sort of stuff, that's when the market can get a little bit distorted in terms of the price signals that come through. But the basic premise of the market is as prices increase, that then gives the um, comfort and gives the financial viability for generators to come into the market. Uh, and that's you know, how, how, how markets work throughout the world. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a mistake to uh, look at this as a, you know, on a macro level and say, I'm not going to uh, allow retail competition to progress until we reach a certain level or something like that. I mean, precisely the whole idea is, that, you know, this is retail, right? So the next customer, I mean, he's only one megawatt. Right? He's only uh, 750 kilowatts, right? So all he really needs to have uh, meaningful competition is, you know, two or three uh, suppliers out there with a little bit of excess capacity. And, you know, that builds uh, momentum and that gives a signal for people to build new plants. I mean, we're building a plant on the basis of uh, uh, expected uh, uh, retail I mean, customers, I mean, contestable customers as a customer base. But I'd make one, one and a half observations here. Um, I've not seen many merchant markets with as much potential supply side activity as we've seen in the Philippines. There's everybody has a project that's advanced to some degree. There's no shortage of, of capacity that could be developed but for approval or financing and, and, and it's kind of falling into place. Um, we personally, we don't see next year being a, you know, a, a tight demand supply market, we see things happening pretty, pretty soon. So, that part doesn't bother me too much. But what's unique about the uh, Philippines um, compared to some of the other markets is actually quite an important uh, point. Um, you have El Nino. If I were a retailer and I had Wesson exposure, I would be scared. Because 
I can predict supply and demand uh, on the basis of fundamentals and expectations, but I can't reduce the variance. I can't, I can't know for sure whether there will or will not be an El Nino next year. I cannot know for sure whether it will be a deep one or a shallow one. I cannot know those things. I can expect, but I cannot know, and my bounds of not knowing are quite wide. So what the purpose of OSM is supposed to do, by design, is to scare people into contracting. That's how it works. There is risk. You put the risk in the Wesson, all the risk you can think of. The risk of insufficiency, the risk of outage, the risk of weather, the risk of temperature, the risk of hydrology, the risk of transmission, everything. And you scare people into contracting or investing. If that process of fear becomes uh, a process of concern, in other words, we don't want people to be afraid of the West and we want to make it a nice place, then it will not work. Because nobody will feel the obligation to sign into a contract to take the risk to protect themselves from another risk, take one kind of risk to protect themselves from another risk. So if you're going to move to retail competition, you have to keep a scary spot market, and the retailers have to be able to enter into contracts. Personally, I think those contracts have to become financial contracts, which is tradable, which don't exist really here yet. And people need to be able to adjust their positions around what scares them. But we don't want to make it less scary. We want to empower people to manage that risk. That's, that's, we're still a little ways away from that, I think. Did anybody else want to have a comment or any other questions about that? Jay from uh, Point Press. Uh, I, to me, the real uh, competition that we, uh, I mean, the real option for retail customers is uh, the, the ability to be able to uh, generate your own power using renewables like solar or whatever. But until technology allows you to generate your own such that it matches uh, the commercial rate then actually it's not yet an option at this point. Especially at this point when setting up your own is still expensive compared to getting it from either Mirago or uh, power utilities. But until that price point goes down, then I think that will be the real competition uh, among the major players. That's what I think. But in that case, will what I think... Um, in a way, it also helps... Uh, the big players because it just addresses the peak load. Because of course you have to plan for backups and everything. Uh, but I don't know the implication of that in terms of um, power rates because if you get less power from the utilities, then that means uh, prices may be going up. So that means your so source of backup power in terms of risk uh, management is higher. I, I mean, it, it, yes, I mean, it's a valid point. The, the distributed generation has ob obvious benefits, but you have to look at it in terms of the impact on the market in general. Uh, and what one of the challenges is in, in distributed generation is if you have an impact of that on the grid uh, and you have costs associated with that, how do you spread those costs over all customers, regardless of whether they're using the distributed generation or not? So. If I go and plug in my house and plug it into the network at the moment, I mean, I'm, I'm causing a small, admittedly small, but I'm causing an intermittency issue within the network. In order to manage that intermittency in the network, there's other different types of generation that you, ne you might need to contract with. Maybe more expensive generation than coal, maybe you need to go for gas or diesel so you have fast response so that you can fill in on these intermittent, intermittent periods. Um, this costs money to do. Uh, it's a more expensive form of generation. Um, the plants are less utilized because they're on off, on off, on off. Uh, and, and, and of course their prices are then higher. So then you have an impact on the market in terms of prices. And how do you spread that cost of that over 
everybody, regardless of whether they're using solar or not, whether they've caused a problem or whether they're just a normal customer who, who's taking it. The second point, of course, is, is the impact on, uh, on distribution utilities and on, on the networks and sort of wise business. And if you want to keep that, that network in the same way that with your broadband, you know, you're, you're paying a fixed amount of your broadband for the, for the providing of that capacity. Uh, and that's the, that's the cost of the wire and stuff that goes into your house. If you're using that, that, that less, yet the costs remain the same, how do you, in a regulated environment, uh, allocate the, in, these costs over the whole generation, over the whole market? And that's a challenge which is, which is happening around the world and something that needs to happen. And it's, it's these disruptive technologies which are going to change the face of the industry. And there's no holding them back. And if you look at an example of a, take a capital intensive industry like the taxis before. You know, this is a capital intensive industry. You have to buy cars, you have to put them on the road, etc. Something like Uber comes along and just changes the whole industry and disrupts the whole industry and changes a completely different business model. And that will happen in utilities as well. But what we do need to make sure we put in place now is the proper regulation uh, in order to handle this and to make sure that entities that you need in a new market, such as distribution utilities and, and, and fast reacting generation, is compensated in a way to make them economically viable. Yeah, I was around uh, many years ago when the discussions were being held about you know how we were going to transition from a fully regulated uh, uh, industry to a more competitive industry, right? And uh, a lot of the discussions then were centered on um, how you needed to remove cross subsidies, how you needed to move more toward uh, market-based, uh, I mean, you know, market costing to be able to. Uh, level the playing field and have a real uh, competitive environment in, in place, right? I'm just worried that, uh, you know, uh, in the process of, you know, trying to protect one constituency or another, um, the result will be more and more cross-subsidies, and we're seeing, a, you know, a lot of that, and, uh, you know, that includes distributed generation. The comment on solar being still expensive, especially renewables um, for household level, um, is very valid. Um, there's no incentive for any end customer to go and implement this. Uh, and the incentives for DUs as well is that they're not encouraging it enough. Um, so I guess the game changer we're all waiting for is the prices to come down. Um, what might happen three to five years from now is if solar plus storage gets to be viable, affordable, then that will be a big game changer for all of us. And we're waiting for that time to come. But at the same time, Gavin, I agree, the regulator has to take that into account because the grid backup always has to be there. And how to compensate for that in some kind of ancillary way is going to have to be a view. Um, at the moment, we're encouraged to put as much kilowatt hours through our networks, which is crazy. We've got time for one more question. One more, yeah, last one, last question. Give everybody a chance. We have we have a taker. Uh, hello, good morning. Um, my questions, my question would be for actually the distribution utilities, because most of them have contracted capacities with their generation companies, and with retail competition coming in, the contestable customers go out of their franchise area. So that in turn would um, entail having stranded capacities for them. Um, so that's one of the concerns when we actually do market for contestable customers. And how do you think that can be addressed? The stranded capacities, um, should they be breaking their current contracts, which actually run for 20 years for a long term? Tricky one under the current circumstances. What we tried to do as a DU was model whether the contestables were going to go out and then just contract so to make sure long term contracts weren't an issue. But unfortunately, it hasn't been possible, they're still there. So we've had to enter into some long term conditions. And the issue of standard capacity is a big risk. The regulator has commented saying they want to make it part of universal charge, which I think is bad. That's another cross subsidy we can do without. 
So we hope that with time, um, contestable market will settle down and we can contra contract longer term. But right now we're talking residential as well. So where does that leave uh, DUs tr traditionally? So it's going to be quite a challenge. Um, it, yes, it is a challenge. I mean, it, in general, instability causes high costs. If, you, if something is stable and you know what's happening, then you can contract against it and you can, you can optimize your costs. I think really what we need is clarity and a, a clear roadmap on how retail competition will come in, which will allow us to make sensible decisions when it comes to contracting uh, and work out how much we contract and how much uh, you know, we don't contract and, and, and how much we expose ourselves. What's very difficult in a market is having such uncertainty over when things will come in, is it this year, is it next year, is it going to drop this, when's the household level coming in, because as you rightly pointed out, you know, supply contracts are not for the next month, they are long term contracts um, and, and they need to have the right clauses inside to allow us to modify the, uh, modify the contract if, if, uh, if we need to, they need to have the right clauses to be able to break the contract to avoid stranded costs, they need to have the right clause to be able to reallocate um, uh, power from contestant market to non-contestant markets. So what's really, really important is, is stability and a clear roadmap, and that will really help us significantly on our contracting. Um, the more uh, uncertainty there is in the market, uh, the more uh, cost will ultimately be there, as, as people will have no choice but to contract in the short term um, and, to, uh, and not to be uh, sure about their supply situation going forward. Well, I I had a similar comment, right? But you know, you need clarity. You need uh, uh, timelines that you can count on, uh, and that'll guide your uh, contracting. Um, and I think the other thing is that you know, right now, while we do have uh, some kind of optionality on the part of uh, contestable customers, I've always argued that they should, uh, you know, have a firm uh, commitment to the utility of how long they're going to stay there. They can't just fence it tomorrow and make another decision. Uh, so, yeah, you can stay with the, I mean, if, if that's the decision, you know, you can stay with the utility, but uh, it should be for a specific period so that your utility can plan uh, on having you around for a year. Mike, if you can just make a comment quickly and a little bit of a story before we close. I know that's your job, but... Uh, um, I have to wear my Western hat, uh, and what has happened in the past is that there needs to be responsible behavior of all the participants in this market for it to work properly. All the participants. Um, and you all know the issues that happened in terms of high price spikes in November, December 2013, and that there's some decisions coming now only from the ERC on what has been found. Um, I, the story I want to tell you is the sick of energy sat in the WSM control room or the way the prices comes in and as he sees the prices come in as an intervener because of that issue at the time just a few months after he phoned up the people who were busy bidding in their prices trading he phoned the trading room and said why are you bidding this price and he managed to stabilize the price doing that he sat in the control room or in the in the WSM room where they were dispatching and influence the pricing from that point of view. So you talk about market intervention, that's one way of doing it. Because of irresponsible behavior of the trading teams, essentially. Um, so just a uh, comment. On, um, on that note, let's uh, wrap up this, uh, this first session of the morning and say thank you to Gavin, uh, Dion, and uh, Juan Antonio for uh, taking questions and uh, sharing their insights. And uh, uh, join me in a round of applause.